You're listening to the Paranormal Peeps on the Dark Cast Network. Come to the dark side of indie podcasts with the Dark Cast Network. We have cookies. Between the realm of the dead and the journeys of the living, join Josh, Jamie, and Elisa as they delve into the vast world of the paranormal and breathe life back into the history of the departed. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Paranormal Peeps podcast. I'm Josh. I'm Jamie. And Elisa is actually doing a dowsing rod session out in front of the Titanic. Oh, nice. Yeah. Must be magic to get down there <laughs> at that depth. She took the magic school bus. Yeah, but does she really need rods to do, like, to communicate with the dead down there? Well, she doesn't need them. She just chose to bring them to use them to see oh. what type of underwater dowsing rod session you could do at... Wouldn't that be confusing for the dowsing rods because you're underwater? And, you know, originally they were kind of used to find water. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't they just, like, be going all over the dang place? They could be, or they're just, like, sitting still. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I found water everywhere. I have news for you. You're in it. <laughs> uh, we have got a great set of stories for you guys today. So our last episode, we talked about Sto uh, stories that sol soldiers had from Iraq. Yeah. And this week's is actually was kind of inspired by Ted Lasso. Not everybody's going to be familiar They're with not, this show. They're not. It's, you guys don't know, it's a, it's a TV show, well, a series actually that was on or is on Apple TV Plus. It's over now. But there's an episode in there where they talk about the place being haunted because during World War I, they went around and to recruit soldiers. They said, hey, they put up these posters that said, hey, if you're good at and want to play soccer professionally, come to the stadium. And so everyone that showed up, yeah, they came to the stadium to get their physicals for soccer, but it was actually being enlisted into the army. Dude. Yeah, it's not real. <laughs> I know, but I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Like, I really don't put it past. People to do that? Yeah. I yeah. really don't. In this day and age and all that, I just I just really don't put it past them. Yeah. I don't put it past people either, but mm -hmm. thankfully that was all fictitious. But it got me thinking. It's like we talked about, we've talked about, soul, like, I've thought about people, uh, spirits and stuff from Normandy, from the D-Day invasion, from World War II. Right. But we don't think about a lot of paranormal experiences associated to the First World War. Right. In fact, most people don't even know how it even started. Well, that's true. So that is what we're going to talk today. We're going to talk ghost stories from World War I. All right. Well, let's get into it. All right. So, as I said, most people don't know how the whole thing started. It actually started on June 28, 1914 with the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie. They were actually out visiting uh, in Sarajevo and Bosnia. Many Bosnians and their Serbian neighbors resented this foreign rule, and the Archduke's visit to Sarajevo provided the opportunity for a small band of Serbian dissidents to strike back. Austria responded to the assassination by teaming up with its ally, Germany, and declaring war on Serbia. Okay. And soon, Fr uh, France, Russia, Belgium all got involved. And eventually, of course, Great Britain got involved to fight against Germany and Austria. That's kind of what started the whole World War I. Now, unlike World War II, which we're all pretty familiar with, World War I was actually what's called trench warfare. And so they would dig in these giant long trenches and shoot at each other across an open field from a bunch of trenches. So, And there was a whole bunch of uh, trench and counter-trench warfare that was going on. So, like, as one side was digging one way, there was other groups that were trying to dig, you know, to cut them off or maybe undermine them, go underneath. And so it was all this kind of strange strategy associated to that, which leads to some of these stories that we're going to have. All right. So the first one is from December 1915. In a frontline trench somewhere in uh, Ypres Salient, uh, Belgium, 2nd Lieutenant William M. Spite of the 3rd Battalion of West Yorkshire Regiment, he sat in a dugout 
and this first and second battalions of Wypress had already been fought and around 200,000 men had already died on that, on that. Yeah. It's amazing. Right. No, it's, it's crazy and sad and yeah, all sorts of things. There were three more battles of Yipers yet to come. Men did not only die in the great battles of the war, they also died all the time. Spite's friend, another officer whose name has not been recorded, had died later had died earlier that day. So in December, in Yipers, uh, it's generally remembered for Germans' first use of poison gas against the British, although the French had had an earlier whiff of it in April that year. On the 19th of December, ahead of raiding parties, to the northeast of Wipers, gas was discharged along the front. Further gas attacks were made on December 20th, turning, in, turning into high explosive shelling that continued into the evening of the 21st of December. It may have been during these attacks, or to a sniper's bullet, or a shell blast, or a fragment of shrapnel, that Spate's friend lost his life. Spate sat in his little dugout in the dim glow of a candle stub, in a melancholy a melancholy watch in a godforsaken hole when who should walk in but his friend. Spate did not record his reaction, nor what the ghost did, but he invited another officer to come into his dugout the following evening in case the ghost should return. The dead officer came once more and after pointing to a spot on the floor of the dugout, vanished. Spade had a hole dug at the spot indicated and about three feet down, spades broke through a narrow tunnel running beneath them. It was packed with fused explosives. The Germans had undermined them. The timers had been set 13 hours on the clock. Time enough for the British to defuse the danger. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that something? It's crazy. I mean, that his friend... It's fascinating that it's like, okay, obviously his friend knew he was dead. Yes. But I think that when you die, you're privy to, obviously, other information that the living are not. Right. And so I wonder if it was one of those things where he died and he knew that this was there. Well, obviously, he knew. Right. And he came back to tell his buddy. To, to, to warn him so that he was buddy would... To try to warn him. So his buddy would live. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. And to my knowledge, he actually survived the war and lived on and, and died of old age. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's his friend coming back. Wow. I would, yeah, that would be just something you'd never forget. No. You know, I think just hearing the story, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Right? It's such, a, it's a, such an amazing story. It's, yeah, it really is. So this next one is labeled an air station ghost. Now, the interesting thing is, remember, in 1915, this is right around or just after the first flight. So... This is the first real combat that planes were actually used. Right. And if you remember Snoopy yep. and the Red Baron. The Red Baron. <laughs> that was all World War One. Yeah, sure was. So very primitive in there in the flying days, so right. to speak. He was the young pilot from the Royal Flying Corps whose ghost is said to haunt the former Angus Airfield, where the fledgling unit had established Britain's first operational military airfield. Ever since Lieutenant Desmond Arthur of the Royal Flying Corps was killed in 1913 when his biplane crashed on a training flight at nearby Lunan Bay, his base at Montrose Airfield has become one of the most haunted places in Britain. Over the years, there have been eyewitness claims of menacing footsteps, mysterious mumbling conversations, ghostly apparitions in First World War flying suits, and the sound of a phantom plane flying overhead. I have a question. Yeah. How are phantom footsteps, how are they menacing? How would you be able to say, okay, I'm hearing footsteps and they're menacing? I don't know that I would ever think a footstep is menacing. I would think like, oh, sounds like someone is stomping or walking fast or maybe like limping. I don't know that I would ever hear footsteps from something on scene and describe them as menacing. Well, I guess if you think if there's a, a cert, certain pattern to footfalls, right, and you associate that to something more menacing coming, maybe that's, I mean, obviously it's a, a, a writing, like, adjective that people, that right. someone uses. I think, it's, I think it's used to kind of pull you in a little bit. Of course. 
and to get you involved, you know, and like what happens next. But for me, I mean, all reality, if I hear footsteps, whether they're stomping, booted, soft, fast, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to say they're maybe like phantom footsteps, but I'm never going to describe them as menacing. What if in this situation, it's a situation of, yes, you hear the footsteps, but maybe it's a feeling that comes out after you hear the and footsteps. That's fair, but if that was true, and given the storytelling of this story, they would indicate that as well. Yeah. And they have not. They have not. Okay. Just a little sidebar there. <laughs> <laughs> and three years ago, Montrose hit the paranormal headlines after an, an old radio in the Airfields Heritage Center filled with cobwebs with no power and no aerial began broadcasting speeches from Winston Churchill and music by the Glenn Miller Orchestra, the Allied's favorite uh, favorite band during the Second World War. All right. But today, it is revealed that the man, said to have started the ghostly sightings and other paranormal phenomena at the base, is to be honored next Monday at a simple wreath-laying ceremony to commemorate the 100th anniversary of his tragic death. A small party from... Montrose Air Station Heritage Center will lay a wreath at his grave in the town's Sleepy Hillock Cemetery. Well, then that's pretty cool. And I'm assuming this was written... 2013. Yeah, so a few years ago. Yeah. So my question comes now is if they did this to honor the 100th like anniversary of his death, did the activity change? Did it lessen? by Because they're honoring him, they're acknowledging him, and sometimes I find that you know, a lot of times you find that that's what spirits really want because, and it's something I always say, nobody likes to be forgotten. No, no one wants Living to be forgotten. or dead. And yeah. I really, truly believe that nobody likes to be forgotten. Um, may, maybe to some it doesn't matter. But I think the simple acknowledgement of someone who has passed and maybe that there are some hauntings going on, I think that... You know, if it, if it's a a nice spirit, <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe they'll be like, okay, I've been I've been acknowledged, I've been seen, I've been heard, I'm good, and yeah. it lessens. Yeah, my under from what I did for my research for that part for this story, this part of the story, it hasn't changed. Like the stuff is still going on. It's still considered a very haunted. So it says it's still. Yeah, it's still a very haunted place. And so I'm assuming it's more than just his spirit because there's, it sounds yes. like there's multiple sightings of airmen. Yeah, air, airmen, uh, menacing footsteps. Now, most of the stuff is gone, right? Like the original airfield and oh, stuff sure. like that. It's all been changed over. Oh, sure. But this was used, my understanding is this was used in World War One and World War Two as a flight operations base. Okay. So if you've got two years of, or not two years, two wars, two wars yeah. of people going and not coming back or going and having experiences and then, and bringing that energy back. That's a lot of emotion that's sucked into this area. Well, just into the environment. Yeah. You know, and because we are, but what energy we are, when but we energy. die, our energy does not disappear. It just switches forms, I believe, but it does not ever go away. Right. It goes somewhere, Just, but it does not just disappear. Yeah. I think that's Newton's third law. I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's something like that. Some, somebody really a sm lot smarter than me came up with the theory of, <laughs> of energy never dissipating, but right. staying. Okay. So Dr. Dan Patton, who's a curator at the Montrose Air Station Heritage Center, he explained that two years after Lieutenant Desmond Arthur's death, reports began to surface of a ghostly figure at the air station. These sightings, which con coincided with an official inquiry into whether the aircraft's plunge to the ground was a result of Lieutenant Arthur's recklessness, caused considerable alarm. It was as if the spirit of this proud pioneer airman had returned to Earth at this slight to his reputation as a skilled pilot. The court of inquiry eventually cleared Lieutenant Arthur of blame, and once exonerated, the ghost made one last appearance on Christmas Eve, 1916, and then disappeared. Wow, so he wanted that corrected because he didn't, you know, why they, why 
people would have viewed it as maybe reckless. Maybe it was something entirely out of his hands that yeah. happened, right? That transpired. Yeah. I mean, and so he's come back saying, hey, look, I was not being reckless or any of these things. It just, you know. It happens. Like, it does. I mean, you're talking about the, the start of aviation, 1913. Like, this is the start of people flying. Well, and, and it could have been mechanical, but the thing is, it, I think 90 plus percent of the time it's pilot error. A lot of times it is. But, I mean, but back then. Back then, because this was all so new, I could understand that a lot more versus yeah. like today. Yeah. Now, now let me back then, there was a lot of mechanical issues and stuff like that. And it's it's not the same as it is today. Well, right. But. Because aviation was so new, you wouldn't necessarily know how to counterreact certain situations. Yeah, there wasn't much training involved. No, that's exactly right. There was, it was like, you know, new things to be discovered and new problems, new bugs. Yeah. That you got to work through and figure out. So reports of ghostly apparitions, however, resurfaced after the Second World War, Dr. Parton said. Circumstances point to the existence, if that is the word, of many ghostly figures at Montrose. But what firmly reestablished Desmond Arthur as the Montrose ghost was an article by Sir Peter Maysfield Field in Flight International in December 1972, by which time RAF Montrose had closed. In the article, Maysfield repeated the original story of Lieutenant Arthur's death and the subsequent appearance of his spirit at Montrose, but with an important new twist. As Maysfield was leaving Delcros, which is Inverness Airport, he, he was approached by a man who asked for a lift in the rear seat of his chipmunk aircraft, so he took off with a passenger. As the chipmunk approached Montrose, Maysfield was astonished to encounter an ancient biplane flying over the airfield, and to his horror, he saw its wing collapse and the pilot fall from the cockpit. There was a cry from his passenger, but when Maysfield turned around, there was nobody in the cockpit. Badly shaken... Maysfield landed at Montrose, took on petrol, and then continued his flight to Brooklands. So he picks up a passenger, right? is flying with said passenger, mm -hmm. witnesses an ancient biplane basically fall out of the sky, his passenger freaks, and disappears. Wow. That sounds like it's some residual of an incident that probably took place. Well, I think the, the airplane part was residual, yeah, but I think the I mean. passenger was not. No, I don't think that. No. <laughs> I think you, I think you, what he got to see was Desmond's demise. Probably. It's very possible. So uh, Dr. Patton revealed when he went to write up in his logbook, he saw that the date was 27 May 1963, exactly 50 years since Desmond Arthur's fatal accident. He had witnessed a reenactment of the tragedy. He added, is there a Montrose ghost and is it Desmond Arthur? There are certainly recent sightings and apparitions of men in flying dress, which defy rational explanation. But we should remember that hundreds of men were killed at Montrose over two world wars. Circumstances point to the existence, if that is the right term, of many ghosts. As far as Lieutenant Arthur is concerned, we should go back to the original story. He returned briefly for a purpose, and once he was cleared of that blame, he departed. He we should let him rest. All the same, on Monday, when we lay the wreath on the grave, it will I will be watching the skies around Montrose. I wonder if anything happened. I wonder if they well, saw see, him. And and this is this is where it'd be nice if there was like maybe just a follow up article. But I'm assuming that probably nothing did happen since nothing was written about it. And what I mean by that is I think that if the person that says like I'll be watching the skies after we lay this wreath and all this stuff, yeah. I mean I'm sure that if more than likely had something been witnessed i'm sure that there would have been some follow-up and maybe there is maybe we just don't we haven't seen it yeah i mean who knows or maybe it's something that if he witnessed something maybe he just kind of kept that to himself yeah one of those moments where you just don't tell anybody about you look up you see the plane flying overhead because it, it would be you know, he saw it 50 years after mm -hmm. you know is it like an every 50 year occurrence hard to say yeah one of the most interesting facts is that following his death, a miniature of a beautiful young woman was found in Lieutenant Arthur's breast pocket. This photograph has now been donated to the Heritage Center, along with Lieutenant Arthur's diary. 
Dan was discovered, or sorry, Dan has discovered that the lady in the photograph and the subject of Lieutenant Arthur's affections was Miss Winsome Ropner from West Hart, uh, Hartlepool. According to her great grandson, who has been in touch with the Montrose Air Station, Miss Ropner never forgot Desmond Arthur. Wow. And you know, I think from whether it's World War One or two, I think there's many stories like that. Yeah. You know, these men go to war and they either have a sweetheart back home or, you know, even a wife or whatever, you know, and they don't come back. And, you know, there's, I think there's lots of stories like that. Yeah. Lots you of know? stories. And the women, you know, obviously they go on and, but they don't ever forget. No. A lot of heartbreak that goes along, that goes along of, with these a things. A lot of emotion. Lots of emotion. The interesting, the, there's one other ghostly occurrence that's happened here. I don't have a, a recorded sighting of it. But there's a black lab that has been seen following people around the museum. Oh, be darned. So like as members of the museum are going around doing their thing, there's mm -hmm. a black lab that will follow them around. Huh. Seems like a friendly dog. Right? <laughs> friendly ghost dog. Friendly ghost dog. So we go from the airfield to Mr. Robert Graves. Okay. At the front in 1915, Lieutenant Robert Graves of the 3rd Battalion Royal Welch Fusilers was counting his lucky escapes. On May 28th, in the chaotic trenches among the brick stacks in Kuchny, in the, se in the sector between Ypres and Somme, he had met a rifle grenade at close range, landing about six feet away. It should have exploded and done him some damage, but against the odds, it landed the wrong way and stuck in the wet clay looking at me. Later in June, he was walking along a trench at Cambridge or Cambrin when he suddenly threw himself flat on his face. Two seconds later, he recalled, a whiz bang struck the back of the trench exactly where he had been. A sergeant who had been walking a few yards ahead came rushing back to ask, Are you killed, sir? Graves reasoned that as the shell was fired from the German battery only a thousand yards off, it must have landed before the sound of it being fired could be heard. How did I know that I should throw myself on my face, he wondered? So Graves had enlisted almost immediately after the war was declared in August 1914. He was commissioned in the 3rd Battalion as a second lieutenant on August 12, 1914, and was promoted to lieutenant on May 5, 1915. He proved to be an able officer and was promoted to captain on August 26, 1915. His wartime experiences included those of the supernatural, and they're all recounted in Goodbye to All That. And it was uh, from Jonathan Cape in 1929. So in summer of 1915, Graves was in and out of Cambrin and, and Kuchny trenches with rest periods billeted in Bethune or one of the surrounding villages such as uh, Vermeil. Although this sector of the line does not have the infamy of Wipers or uh, Somme, Despite the fact that the Royal Munster Fusilers had lost 11,000 men the month before. That is a lot of people. That's a lot. Dre's reported the casualties were high. Pessimism crept into the men's bones along with the chill of the long night watches. Graves noted that pessimism made everyone superstitious. Graves became pessimistic and superstitious too. I found myself believing in signs of the most trivial nature. In I, one, could, I could see that. Yeah, right? I really could. I mean, you got to think, like... It's not like war today. War today isn't this constant. I mean, these guys were living in these trenches. Mm -hmm. War was all around them of all course. the time. Yeah. And these trenches were horrible. They were wet. It was nasty. And like, I can understand being pessimistic. I could. Yeah. So one evening in late June, Graves and the other officers were having a special dinner in the C Company billet to celebrate having made it through another tour of duty in Kuchny. Graves recounted their menu with relish, including the three bottles of pomard. He looked up and saw Private Chandler, 1st Battalion, Royal Welsh Fusilers, at the window. Chandler saluted and walked on. There was no mistaking him, said Graves, or the cap badge he was wearing. Graves knew that there was no Royal Welsh Battalion within miles of Bethune, he jumped up and looked out the window. There was no one there except a fag end smoking on the pavement. Graves had known him from the regimental depot 
and Wrexham, where they were in the F Company together, and the Lancaster internment camp where both were sent on detachment duty. He went out with the draft to join the 1st Battalion. He shook Graves' hand and said, I'll meet you again in France, sir. That was the last time he saw him alive. Wow. Yeah, crazy, huh? Yeah. It's like, hey, look, there's my buddy. Just walking by the window. (laughs) And he's been dead. (laughs) Yep. There he is. Yeah. I can't imagine. No. I I really couldn't. And the thing is, is like they talk about cat badges. That's just a a symbol that they have on their on their hat to Mm -hmm. identify what who they're with. Right. And so, like, you're not going to mistake those things. No, you wouldn't. So, yeah, that's that's kind of crazy. I would love to see the rest of his stories. I mean, I I think I I would think it'd be fun to get the book. I think so too. It's probably not a bad idea. No, because it's just a whole bunch of his stories from World War One, which. Let's face it, like that was over 110 years ago. Long time. Yeah. Long, long time. Long time ago. So this one is, was Corporal Bird saved by his dead brother at Vimney Ridge? Oh, sounds good. So Corporal Will Bird of the 42nd Battalion, the Black Watch of Canada, was sleeping fitfully in his cold dugout near Vimney Ridge. April 1917, two warm hands on his back woke him. He opened his eyes, expecting to see one of the lads from his company, but there was his brother, Steve. Steve Byrne was also in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, or had been. He had been killed some two years earlier. Oh, dang. So a while ago. A while ago. Yeah. Will watched as Steve rose and walked towards the dugout door. Before leaving, Steve turned and beckoned to Will to follow. Will got up and followed his brother out into the cold pre-dawn morning. Steve led Will over no man's land to a ruined building and then vanished. Will collapsed. Will woke up several hours later and hurried back to the trenches before he could be missed. The dugout, however, was no more. A German shell had scored a direct hit, killing everyone inside. Oh, jeez. William Richard Bird was born in East Mapleton, Nova Scotia in 1891. Soon after the Great War broke out, he and his younger brother, Steve, uh, Stephen, volunteered for the Army. Will, however, was rejected due to his poor condition of his teeth. Steve was killed in France in 1915. Due to the demand for more men, military health standards were lowered, and after having some teeth removed, Will was accepted into service in the 42nd Battalion and sailed for Europe as part of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Wilbur was demobilized in 1919, returning to Nova Scotia, where he settled in a village of Southampton, married, and started a family. He named his son Stephen after his brother. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know Man's Land is? So you, we have trench, German trenches on one side, and in this case, Canadian or English trenches on the other side. Right. The, the area in between them is no man's land. Right. So his brother. It's not one side or the other. Exactly. So his brother led him out in front of the trenches. In no man's land. Into no man's land. And that's where he passed out. Well, in that building, in the old. Well, it was by a ruined building. So, like, it was, like, destroyed, demolished. Or yeah, like, that's what I mean. Yeah. But it was, but that's where he got led. And then he ended up passing out. But that's what saved his life. Exactly. Wow. Brotherly love right there. Yep. So this one is called. The Story of the Leaning Virgin. In January 1915, the church in French town of Albert, the Basilica of Notre Dame de Barbares, was shelled. The gold statue of the Virgin Mary topped its bell tower was hit. Instead of crashing to the ground, it held on for dear life, teetering on the edge of the church tower in a near horizontal position. The British troops in town, which was just a few miles from the front lines of the Somme, quickly established a superstition that if the statue fell, the war would end. With the Entente powers presumably losing, the powers that be did not want to tempt fate, so they fixed the leaning virgin in place with cables. Hearing this, the Germans tried for three years to shell the belfry and knock over the statue to no avail. The Germans captured the town in 1918 and occupied the tower. Ironically, 
It was the British artillery that eventually brought down the gold, Golden Virgin crashing down onto the street below. A few months later, the, role, the war was over with the Allies as victors. Huh. The church has faith, faithfully rebuilt after the war, and the replica of the original statue now watches over the town. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm glad they rebuilt. Me too. The church and stuff. But yeah, I mean, interesting that they tried to take it out for three years. Couldn't do it. And then when it was finally was taken out, the war did end. <laughs> I'll be darned. So this last one is kind of an amazing story. It's a long one. They've all been amazing in their own ways, Yes. Right? This one has a, a few different iterations, it, it, and it's tough to find a good full story just because of of uh, the nature of it. And so everything I can find is usually, everything else I found was usually one or two or three sentences. So you're going to have to kind of piece it together? Yeah, I got I got a, a, a nice, decent story. But yeah, it's going to be a little bit broken up. Is it going to make sense? It will make sense. Okay, that's the important part. It will make sense. Um, and this is about the Battle of Mons. So it was fought between the 22nd and 23rd of August in 1914. It was the first major battle in which British Army was involved, and it was one episode in the broader campaign for the Battle of the Frontiers. Since the war's opening, Germany Im implemented the sh the whoa. Since the war's opening, Germany implemented the Schleifen Plan, designed to knock France out before Russia could bring in her considerable army. Germany hoped to settle things on the Western Front, secure it, and then turn to the Eastern Front in Russia, facing their main opponents separately with all her might. It was not going to be in the Battle of Mons, which occurred right before the fateful Battle of, of the Marne, was a fist alarm. What is that? I have no idea. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Already at the opening of, of hostilities, Germany had tried to avoid contact with the bulk of the French forces along the German border. They bypassed them, marching through neutral Belgium and occupying Brussels on August 20th. But the Belgian resisted and slowed down the German timetable at a crucial phase of the plan. Meanwhile, French and British forces were sent north to aid the Belgian army. The British Expeditionary Force consisted of two corps initially deployed near the French border with Belgium. In order to execute a counterthrust, the British Expeditionary Force advanced on the Belgian city of Mons on the 22nd of August. The plan was to use the area's bottlenecked waterways to cut off the German army. But the French accidentally engaged the Germans alone and ahead of schedule, suffering many casualties. This forced them to retreat so hastily the British did not know what had happened until they reached their position. Finding themselves facing the German force alone, the British had no choice but to hold ground until the French regrouped. The fighting began on the morning of the 23rd of August. Germans pressed on the Mons Central Canal as they tried to pass. But the British held their ground. The professional soldiers of the British Expeditionary for Force were skilled marksmen who could fire 15 aimed shots a minute, but some could do even more better than that. They were so effective and caused so many casualties among the opponents that the Germans thought they were facing mass machine guns, when in fact, it was the British infantry's skill with the Lee Enfield rifle that kept them at bay. But but the British were outnumbered two to one. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. And by nightfall, they were overrun. Abandoning the, abandoning the city was the only hope, so they retreated. For two straight days and nights without food or sleep pursued by the Germans. Eventually, they managed to reunite with the French. And without rest, on the 26th of August, the armies clashed again in the Battle of La Chateau. The Allied forces were finally able to stop the Germans, but not with a victory, but with a stalemate. The costs had been high. The BEF had lost 12,000 soldiers, at least a tenth of its total forces, in just nine days of battle. With casualties that were already half the total casualties of the Crimean War, a conflict that lasted two years. When news reached the home front, the population was incredulous. 
the losses were shockingly high. The battle had not been won. For the British, the war had started with a retreat. The news of the retreat profoundly touched the British, and among them, 51-year-old Arthur uh, Machin, a Welsh journalist and supernatural author. Twenty years before, he had become very popular with his paranormal novella, The Great God Pan. But it was a long time ago. Now he mostly wrote articles for the London Evening News. The scant details that reached Brit Britain about the retreat of Mons touched him so much that he started to think up a story to comfort himself. As he later recalled, as an author, he was moved by the remarkable achievement of the BEF that single-handedly -hand withstood the outnumbered German army alone and a subsequent exhausting retreat without food or sleep. No report he read ever talked about any supernatural events, but it was Manchin's nature as a fantasy writer to turn fiction events into supernatural. The, title, the story he wrote was entitled The Bowman. It contained a thinly disguised version of the Battle of Mons, the same acts of bravery in subsequent retreat in the story, a soldier from the British battalion in the heat of the battle calls upon St. George for help, and soon St. George appears on a white charger surrounded by a company of Welsh long bowmen from the 1415 Battle of Angicourt. Interesting. So this is part of the story. It's kind of nice. In one action during the long retreat, an under strength British battalion about to be overrun by masses of German infantry became aware of a shadowy army fighting beside them, an army of bowmen of the days of Angicourt, five centuries gone. These phantom men at arms cried aloud to St. George and their swift arrows darkened the sky. A great voice was heard to thunder over the din of battle. Array, array. German prisoners taken in, in the action said they were bewildered that their British opponents had reverted to wearing armor and shooting arrows. <laughs> in the night of the 26th, the third day of retreat west of Belgium, weary British soldiers saw tall, unearthly figures materialized in the gloom above the German lines. They were winged like angels, and as they hovered in the gathering darkness, the Germans inexplicably halted and the British slipped away for, to safety. During the retreat, some soldiers swore that they had seen the face of the patron saint of England. A wounded Lancaster fusilier asked a nurse for a picture or a medal of St. George, because he had said he had seen the saint leading the British troops. A wounded gunner confirmed the story. He described the saint the same way the fusilier had a tall, yellow haired man on a white horse wearing golden armor and wielding a sword. Other soldiers agreed that he looked just like his image on the gold sovereigns of the day. Three soldiers were interviewed separately by the vicar of the church near Keswick in the north of England. All agreed that a miracle had saved them from a massive German force about to overrun their unit. As the hard-pressed British troops prepared to fight to the end, the Germans suddenly recoiled. A British prisoner explained that the attack was aborted because they saw strong British reinforcements coming up. In fact, the ground behind the British unit was empty. The men interviewed had no doubt who authored their salvation. It was God, they said. One lance corporal told his nurse of the apparition of angels during the Mons retreat. He could see, he said, quite plainly in midair a strange light which seemed to be quite distinctly outlined and was not a reflection of the moon, nor were there any clouds. The light became brighter. I could see quite distinctly three shapes, one in the center having what looked like outspread wings. The other two were not so large, but were quite plainly distinct from the central one. They were above the German line facing us. We stood watching them for about three quarters of an hour. All the men with me saw them. I have a record of 15 years good service, and I should be very sorry to make a fool of myself by telling a story merely to please anyone. The soldier also told his story to another woman, a Red Cross hospital superintendent, who interviewed the man and believed his believed him implicably. So did Harold Begbie, a writer on the supernatural, who related his tale in his 1916 book On the Side of Angels. Bergby was impressed with the soldier's uh, transparent honesty. Begbie also interviewed another soldier who spoke of a bright light in the sky. Still another told Begbie that he had heard men in, French, in France talking about the celestial apparitions. He was, Begbie wrote, 
definitively conscious of supernatural presence. The soldier in question was Grenader Corps, NCO, hardly a type to give into hysteria and delusion. Another tale was told of a cold stream guard unit lost in the gloom of early morning. One man saw a glow in the darkness, a glow that became the figure of a female angel dressed in white with a gold band around her hair. Gesturing to the tired guardsmen, she led them through the night to a sunken road, a way out of danger that cold stream patrols had not been able to find and afterwards could not find again on any map. An English woman nursing in France wrote of a wounded Lancaster fusilier who asked her for a religious medal. He was Catholic. Was he Catholic, she asked? No, he said. He was a Methodist, but he had seen St. George mounted on a white horse, leading the British into action against overwhelming odds. The next minute, he said, comes this funny cloud of light, and when it clears, there's a tall man with yellow hair and golden armor on a white horse holding his sword up his mouth open as if he was saying, come on, boys, I'll put the the kibosh on the devils. Then, before he could say knife, the Germans had turned and were after them, fighting like 90. Wow. So, in one side, you have a guy that said that he wrote a story. Yep. And none of this was true. Okay. And on the other side, you have 10 stories. 10 plus. Of varying degrees of a similar scenario. Right. It's all from different perspectives in a way, if you think about it. Yes. Like we were over here. This is what we saw. Yep. And we were here and this is what we saw. Yeah. But something happened. Something happened. Absolutely. So it, it's an amazing story. There's pictures on the web, on the, on the web you can see where there's uh, people, you know, they're obviously artist renditions of it, right? Sure. And you can see these clouds open up and there's all of these bowmen, Sending up their raining arrows down on the German troops. And is any of it true? Don't, Don't know. know. People see people have, have been said to see a lot of different things during war. I believe it. And you're talking about a force that's fighting that has half the number of people yeah. as the other force. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, there's been all sorts of amazing things that have happened during war where unsurmountable insurmountable odds have people have won yeah and so it's not unheard of for that to happen and to not even win but to to draw a stalemate is even impressive in itself right but yeah i mean it's hard to say what actually happened again it's 115 plus years ago or 110 well, right. plus and years in, ago unless you were there witnessing these things firsthand you really just don't know nope it just comes down to are you open-minded? Yeah. And the thing is, is, and I, I can say this, having served, no official report is ever going to have, we were saved by supernatural forces. God saved us. That's not going to be in any official report, period. So it being passed down by word of mouth to people seems much more likely of a scenario for things to happen. Yes, I would agree. So... But those are the stories for this week. And I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Hope you found them interesting. And if you guys did, please like and subscribe. Leave us a review. Leave us a rating. It, it all helps. Yeah. Or if you have an idea or have had a personal experience with something otherworldly, something supernatural, let us know. Yeah. Something you want to listen to us cover, you know, email us your ideas. Yeah, send them out to us. And as always, stay ghosty, my peeps. Did you know one of the few things that Nostradamus correctly predicted was his own death? Did you know that only one professional baseball player has been killed while playing the game? What about the fact that one of the most poignant last words ever were spoken by a parrot? Each week on Famous Last Words, we'll examine some of the final thoughts of some of the most fascinating people in history. From presidents to murderesses, from business innovators to teen pop icons. That's Famous Last Words, part of the Darkcast Network, available right now wherever you get your podcasts.
Thank you for listening to the Paranormal Peeps podcast. You can find us on social media at Twitter at CPR Paranormal, on Facebook at Paranormal Peeps Podcast and Cold Spot Paranormal Research. And you can find us on Instagram at Cold Spot underscore Paranormal underscore Research.